Hi, welcome to my latest instalment in my questions about Anne Boleyn series. I'm Claire Ridgway, I run the Anne Boleyn Files website and you might also know me from some books I've written on Anne Boleyn, for example The Fall of Anne Boleyn, A Countdown. Now, my last video I talked about the myth, and yes it was a myth, of Anne Boleyn being sent abroad because of her scandalous or alleged scandalous behaviour with her father's butler and chaplain. And so I thought I'd move on from that with, with on the same kind of topic of Anne Boleyn's love life and answer the question, was Anne Boleyn involved with any other men apart from King Henry VIII, who of course, you know, she was famously involved with. And I'm actually going to be splitting this into two videos. So this is part one. Now, of course, the short answer to this question, was Anne Boleyn involved with any other men, is yes. So, you know, there you go. You can stop watching now, but please don't. Because I'm going to tell you about the other men that she is linked to. Now, Anne was not linked with um, any man while she was abroad, while she was, uh, well, she was rather young, I suppose, in uh, Margaret of Austria's court and wasn't there very long, only a year. But then she went on to serve Queen Claude, serving her from 1515 to late 1521. But there's no mention uh, in the sources of her being involved with any man at that time. But then the first man that we have mention of being linked to Anne is James Butler, because Anne was recalled from serving Queen Claude due to negotiations for her to marry James Butler. But who was James Butler? I mean, if you've read biographies of Anne, then you, you will know about him, but he's not a name that you just come across really in relation to Anne. So who was he? Well, he was the son of Sir Pierce Butler, a member of the Butler family of Ireland. And Anne Boleyn's uh, paternal grandmother, Lady Margaret Butler, who married Sir William Boleyn and became Lady Margaret Boleyn, was a member of this family. Now, Margaret Butler was the daughter of Thomas Butler, who was seventh Earl of Ormond and he had served on King Henry VII's uh, Privy Council, and he'd also been Catherine of Aragon's first Lord Chamberlain. Now, this Earl of Ormond died in, in his 80s, a very good age for Tudor times, in August 1515. But he didn't leave any direct male heirs. He had two daughters. And so this led to a dispute over his earldom uh, between Sir Pierce Butler, who was the earl's cousin's son, I believe, and Thomas Boleyn, Anne Boleyn's father, <coughs> who was the earl's grandson. Um, I'll give you a link to a detailed article um, about this family relationship on the Anne Boleyn Files website. It just gives you a bit more information on the family tree, which is uh, rather complicated, a bit too complicated to uh, go into in this talk, just to see how all the butlers were linked and with the Boleyns too. So we have this dispute over the earldom of Ormond with Sir Pierce Butler on one side and Thomas Boleyn, Anne Boleyn's father, on the other. Now, Thomas Boleyn had Henry VIII's support for his claim, but Sir, P Sir Pierce Butler had the advantage of being in Ireland, being on the ground in Ireland. And so he seized the estates and he started calling himself Earl of Ormond. So there was quite a dispute over this. And in an attempt to keep everyone happy, because Henry VIII wanted to keep Thomas Boleyn happy, but he also wanted to keep the situation in Ireland sort of under control and everything happy there. So in 1520, Henry VIII and his right-hand man at the time, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, put forward the idea of a marriage match between Pierce's son James, James Butler, 
and Thomas Boleyn's daughter, Anne Boleyn. Now, this match that they were arranging would mean that the earldom would pass to James on Sir Pierce's death and then on to James and Anne's issue because James and Anne would marry and would hopefully, uh, you know, have children and one of those children would inherit the earldom. Now, of course, this earldom would be in the Boleyn Butler family, but it would bypass Thomas Boleyn. So we don't know how happy or unhappy he was about this idea, but that is why there were these marriage negotiations, just to try and keep everyone happy and to sort out this dispute over the earldom. Now, James Butler, the son of Pierce, was appointed to serve in Cardinal Wolsey's household in preparation for the marriage. And as I said, Anne was recalled from serving Queen Claude in France to come back to England to prepare herself for the marriage as well. But these negotiations fizzled out, so they suddenly kind of disappear from the records. And it actually took until 1528 for the earldom to be sorted out uh, properly. A deal was brokered which involved Pierce Butler receiving 14 of the Ormond manors on a 30-year lease, so that would kind of keep him sort of semi-happy, and also being elevated to the peerage. In return, the deal was, he had all that in return for relinquishing the earldom of Ormond to Thomas Boleyn. So Thomas Boleyn would get the title and Pierce would get those manners and a peerage as well. Now, as we know, James and Anne never married. It never happened. And in 1530, um, James married Joan Fitzgerald, who was daughter and heir of James Fitz Fitzgerald, who was the late Earl of Desmond. James ended up with the Earldom of Ormond eventually in August 1539, and he held it until his death in 1546. Interestingly, James's widow, Joan, ended up marrying Sir Francis Bryan, who was related, although by marriage, not blood, uh, to Anne Boleyn. So we've got that, those links there. Sir Francis Bryan was the uh, courtier that lost his eye in a jousting accident. I think he was shown in the Tudors series with, with an eye patch and he was also, his nickname was the Vicar of Hell. So you've got some links there. She ended up marrying him. I always wonder, you know, what if in these kind of things, if only Anne had married James, she could have been settled in Ireland at Kilkenny Castle, the butler family seat, and away from court and away from everything. But sadly, that never happened. Now, not long after Anne's debut at the English court, after she'd returned from France, um, she began serving uh, Queen Catherine of Aragon, and she became involved with a young man who was also serving at court. He was serving in the household of Cardinal Wolsey, and he was Henry Percy. He was a son and heir of the Earl of Northumberland. So this is the second man that Anne is properly linked to. According to George Cavendish, who was Wolsey's gentleman usher and who wrote a biography of Wolsey, Percy would then resort for his pastime unto the Queen's chamber and there would fall in dalliance among the Queen's ladies being at the last more conversant with Mistress Anne Boleyn than with any other. And it was then in around 1523 that there grew such a secret love between them that at length they were insured together, intending to marry. George Cavendish goes on to tell of how King Henry VIII then found out about uh, this romance between one of the Queen's ladies and one of Wolsey's household, and that he was much offended because of his own secret affection. 
Apparently the king spoke to Wolsey and consulted with him to infringe the pre-contract between Anne and Percy. Wolsey then called Percy into his presence and chided him, saying, I marvel not a little of thy peevish folly that thou wouldest tangle and ensure thyself with a foolish girl yonder in the court, I mean Anne Boleyn. Dost thou not consider the estate that God hath called thee unto this world? For after the death of thy noble father, thou art most like to inherit and possess one of the most worthiest earldoms of this realm. Therefore, it had been most meet and convenient for thee to have sued for the consent of thy father in that behalf, and to have also made the king's highness privy thereto, requiring then in his princely favour. So Wolsey is having a go at Percy. This is according to George Cavendish for getting involved with a woman that's beneath him when he's to become one day the Earl of Northumberland. And he did all this without consulting his father or the king. The cardinal explained to the young man that the king would have found him a much better match according to your estate and honour. And that by pre-contracting himself to Anne, that Percy had offended both the king and his father with his willfulness. Now, according to George Cavendish, Wolsey then informed Henry Percy that he was going to send for his father to come to court so that he could either break this unadvised contract or else disinherit thee forever, and that the king had intended to have preferred Anne Boleyn unto another person. Percy's response to this telling off, and it was quite a telling off from his master, uh, Cardinal Wolsey, uh, his response was to weep, to apologise for offending the king, but he defended Anne's status, her right noble parentage, and his right to choose a convenient wife. So he did stick up for himself and he did stick up for Anne. He then asked the cardinal to entreat the king on his behalf because apparently, according to Cavendish, in this matter I have gone so far before many so worthy witnesses that I know not how to avoid myself nor to discharge my conscience. But Wolsey ordered Percy to stay away from Anne and then the Earl of Northumberland, Percy's father, arrived at court and gave Percy yet another telling of, calling his son a proud, presumptuous, disdainful and a very unthrift waster and wasteful prodigal. Oh dear, poor Percy getting it in the neck from Cardinal Wolsey and his father. Now, Cavendish goes on to explain that this alleged pre-contract uh, between Percy and Anne was then dissolved and Percy was married off to Mary Talbot, who was the daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury. But unfortunately for Percy, um, it was a very, very unhappy marriage. And by 1530, he and Mary were pretty much leading separate lives. They really, really didn't get on. Um, in 1532, according to Eustace Chapri, um, the imperial ambassador, whose uh, dispatches are an excellent source for finding out goings-on at uh, the Tudor court, Percy, who was by this time Earl of Northumberland, his father having died, had to deny, this was in 1532, in front of the King's Council, a pre-contract between himself and Anne Boleyn, because his wife Mary claimed that he told her in a quarrel that he was not really her husband because he'd previously been betrothed or legally contracted to Anne Boleyn. So their marriage wasn't valid. Um, you, know, you, can, you can imagine the kind of quarrel this being thrown about. Mary made these claims in a letter to her father asking him to pass the information on to the king because obviously the king by this time, by 1532, was heavily involved with Anne Boleyn, was trying to get his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled so that he could marry Anne. 
But instead of passing the information directly on to the king, the Earl of Shrewsbury, Mary's father, decided to pass the information on to the Duke of Norfolk. Now, the Duke of Norfolk was Anne's uncle, and Norfolk decided that he wasn't going to take the information on to the king. He decided to tell Anne what was being claimed, what was happening. Now, Anne decided that she was going to handle this situation straight on. She wasn't going to try and cover it up. She was going to just handle it straight on. So she told her sweetheart, the king, of Mary's claims and asked him to investigate it so that she, she and Percy could be cleared of these allegations. So Percy was interrogated by the Duke of Norfolk and two archbishops and he swore on the Blessed Sacrament um, in front of the Duke and the Archbishops and also the King's canon lawyers that there had never been a pre-contract between him and Anne Boleyn, that he had never been contracted to marry. A pre-contract means like a betrothal, it means you're, you're, you're being... Um, you are promising to marry someone. So he denied the existence of a pre-contract with, with Anne Boleyn. Um, swearing something on the Blessed Sacrament is um, a very important thing because um, it affected the fate of your mortal soul. If you lied on the sacrament, on the Eucharist, uh, you know, your, your mortal soul could be damned. So this was a huge thing for Percy to do and he swore that it had never existed. But this was something that came up again four years later in May 1536 when Anne Boleyn, of course, fell and she was in the tower awaiting her execution. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramner, was looking for grounds to annul the marriage of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, because he'd been ordered to do that. And sort of Thomas Cromwell came up with the idea of oh, well, there was that pre-contract. You know, there were claims of a pre-contract between Henry Percy and Anne Boleyn. You know, couldn't we use that? You know, that, that pre-contract would mean that Anne's, Anne's uh, marriage to the king was uh, null and void because she was already, you know, tied up with someone else. It, it's like a bigamous union. Percy was once again forced to deny it and he did for it forcefully in a letter reminding um, Cromwell that uh, he had sworn on the sacrament in front of the Duke, the Archbishops, the canon lawyers. He'd, he'd done that, he denied it then and he was denying it now and he was very, very angry about it. Now, it is impossible to know exactly what went on between Henry Percy and Anne Boleyn and how far their relationship had gone, but there is absolutely no evidence to back up the idea that is quite often put forward in novels, in fiction, that they did in fact have some kind of secret wedding and that they consummated their relationship, making it a valid uh, legal marriage. There's, there's no, no evidence for that. And we also don't know the real reason why the romance between Henry Percy and Anne Boleyn was actually broken up. I mean, I've explained that George Cavendish in his biography of Wolsey um, writes that it was due to the king becoming attracted to Anne Boleyn and wanting her for himself. But Cavendish was writing a bit later. He was, he was writing with the hindsight of knowing that Anne Boleyn and the king would become involved. Uh, and that may have coloured how he read the situation. It is far more likely that Henry VIII and Wolsey broke up the romance because negotiations were ongoing for Anne Boleyn to marry James Butler and for Henry Percy to marry Mary Talbot, uh, daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury, that those two things were being negotiated and Percy and Anne falling in love with each other without the permission of their families and the king and it was just mucking up these negotiations 
could be a risk to these negotiations. Sadly, Henry Percy was to become involved in Anne Boleyn's fall in 1536, not just because he ended up having to once again deny the pre-contract, but because he was a member of the jury at Anne Boleyn's trial on the 15th of May, 1536. So he had to sit through watching the woman he once loved being tried for high treason and he ended up having to give a verdict, like the other jurors, of guilty. He gave his verdict of guilty and then promptly collapsed. He had to be carried out of the King's Hall at the Tower of London where Anne's trial had taken place. And he ended up, because of his collapse, missing the subsequent trial of George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, of course, Anne Boleyn's brother. He was tried straight after Anne. And Henry Percy died in 1537, so a year later. We don't know how he felt about Anne by this time. Um, but it just seems very sad that the man that had once loved her and wanted to marry her ended up having to find her guilty of high treason and knowing that that would lead to her death. So I will be carrying on in my next instalment by looking at uh, other men that Anne Boleyn was linked to in a romantic way. But I'll leave you there for now and I will give you links to the um, article um, which just explains uh, the Butler family and how they were related to the Boleyns and why there was this dispute over the earldom in Ireland. Thank you for tuning in. I do hope you're enjoying this series, Questions About Anne Boleyn. You can, of course, subscribe by just clicking down there and you can hit the bell to be notified of new videos. Do check out my On This Day in Tudor History videos too. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.